I'm Josh Lamore. I'm going to be talking about HDR and what those letters mean and um, what it's going to mean to all of us as content creators, how it's going to change our lives, what it means, uh, both challenges, good, bad, but really just trying to dig into what those letters stand for. So to kind of start digging into it, we, we dissect video, and I'm going to jump right in. We, we dissect video into five key areas that benefit the image. Uh, along those, image size or resolution, uh, you guys are obviously very familiar with the move to 4K, uh, obviously the move to HD. So we kind of gone down that path of increasing resolution. Frame rate, there's been discussions. Some people have tried increasing frame rate in the theater. Um, others are looking into increasing frame rate for sports. Frame rate gives you an increase in temporal resolution. Uh, what I'm really going to talk about today are the three other pillars, which are bit depth, which is the precision of how you sample the color, color volume, which is how many colors are available in your palette, and dynamic range, which is effectively your difference between your lowest dark point and your highest highlight. So all three of these areas add up to be what we call high dynamic range, because you are increasing the overall color volume as you do this. So as we go into high dynamic range, if we look at today on the left, we'll have stops, so we can talk in language we all understand, which is how much contrast or how many stops can a camera capture, for instance, versus how much we actually present on the screen. So human eye, a little bit over 16 stops at dynamic range at any given moment that somebody can see and perceive at the exact same moment. Cinema cameras today, you guys are very familiar with these probably. Um, cinema cameras in about where film got to before it started trailing off, uh, capture about 14 stops of dynamic range. Stops, for those of you who don't know, is a doubling of light, so every stop is a double on the effect of light that you can capture, which is a measurement of your contrast ratio. When we capture these 14 stops, we actually go through a grading process. As we go through a grading process, we use a monitor to grade to, uh, whether it's a theatrical projector or a home video standard dynamic range monitor, we grade to that monitor and effectively take that 14 stops and bring it down to about six. The reason we do this is because there's been a defined standard for standard dynamic range uh, and for digital, digital cinema, and we have to adhere to that to ensure consistency across the board for all projectors and for home TVs. Now as we move to high dynamic range, televisions are coming out with more colors available to them, more contrast ratio available to them. And what that means is either we have to let the content stretch to that, or we're going to have to do something with the content to ensure that the content looks appropriate within this new space. And then, of course, there will be an ever-evolving higher dynamic range. The reason being, as technology continues to advance, you can always make it better. So people will increase the amount of dynamic range you can get on the screen, or increase the dynamic range you can get in the theater. What I'd like to point out about high dynamic range is it is all about contrast. It is all about dynamic range. The perceived increase in sharpness, and we'll show you some of this in a little bit, perceived increase in sharpness is not a resolution thing. It is because of the contrast and the local contrast within a panel that allows you to see more within that space. Uh, it's been described as being seen as three-dimensional, even when it's not, or even when you're not wearing 3D glasses. The reason for this, the perception of more depth is coming out of that local contrast increase. So how you use this to tell a story could be very different. You make creative choices based on what the palette and the tool set you have is, and here you have a wider tool set, it doesn't mean that you should push it as bright as possible, because that might not tell your moody story. So we use this example of a mushroom in a forest. On the left you see a moody mushroom in the forest. Whereas on the right, if it's made brighter, it's no longer telling the moody mushroom in the forest. It's now telling a story about a bright mushroom in, in a very well-lit forest. So it's completely different intention of what the storyteller would want. So how you manage these new tools will be very important to how you tell that story. HDR, it's not a just for the top tier budgets. There are solutions out there for doing high dynamic range for any budget. Uh, Technicolor takes a good, better, best approach. Uh, meaning that we effectively have different tiers with different solutions that tie to a different amount of uh, colorist time and therefore can either decrease your costs or increase your quality. These are all trade-offs that people make when they budget for different productions. 
there are different options to get to high dynamic range. And we'll go over some of those as we dig into this. So Technicolor is an open standards, open focus company. Our goal is to create those open standards. So similar to standard dynamic range, where you had one target that would fit all standard dynamic range TVs, we have the same desire. Create one open standard that allows that same piece of content to hit everyone's home the same way. That was talking about dynamic range. Let's talk about color. So for years, for standard dynamic range for the home, our color gamut, the amount of colors we had available to us, was that interior triangle, which is Rec. 709. That's been the standard we've graded to for the home. Uh, it is more limited than what we had in digital cinema, but it is our target and we knew what we were getting. Now DCI-P3 is the cinema color space. And as we move to high dynamic range where we're getting more contrast, we're also getting more color. So we're now able to move to P3 primaries, which allow us to get similar colors to what we had uh, in the theatrical projection. So now we can get more color on the screen as well as more luminance. And the combination of both allows for things like a bright blue sky. Whereas before, you had to either choose a bright sky that turned white because we pushed it too high and clipped out detail, or you had to choose a blue sky, which meant that it was dimmer. So now, because we have more light available to us and more colors available to us, we can actually push everything higher. And then Rec 2020. Rec 2020 right now is a theoretical space. What I mean by this is it's very difficult to accomplish and technology that exists today can't yet accomplish it. So there are theatrical projectors that are going out in the marketplace with laser, uh, laser diodes to do their primaries, which are getting really close to this Rec 2020 space, but they can't get there yet. So a lot of people uh, in the theatrical space are actually still doing P3 color. Even though they're doing P3 color, it's going in a Rec 2020 container and being presented to the screen as a Rec 2020 file, but the colors are within a P3 space. As we open up the functionality of these new projectors, we'll start to be able to explore even more colors than we ever had before in the theater. So I'm going to break my talk up into theatrical distribution and home distribution. And because these are two different targets, you're going to have two different uh, ways to make the content. Similar to how we had two different ways to make the content we were, when we were doing our standard dynamic range stuff, the stuff we've been doing for years, we had a digital projector and a theatrical grade, and we had a home video grade. Same thing is going to apply when we move to high dynamic range. You will have a high dynamic range theatrical grade, or more than one, and we'll dig into that. And you will have a home video grade that is a target for your high dynamic range content, and we'll dig into that. So starting with theatrical, and we'll go back to uh, our Pentagon, and in here we'll look at what we've been doing in theatrical grading. So to date, we've basically been doing 2K grading. There are 4K projectors out there, but the majority of digital cinema projection for distribution is 2K. Uh, 24 frames, that may or may not change depending on who the creative is. 12-bit, we've been using 12-bit precision for distribution for DCPs. And P3 color and 48 nits. Nits is a measure of brightness. So that's how white it can go. That, compared to how dark it can go, gives you your contrast ratio, which is your dynamic range. The reason I don't include black level in this is different digital projectors have different black levels, so there's varying on the black level. But we'll include some about black level as we get into uh, grading for the home, because there, there are standards that are, people are targeting. Moving to high dynamic range, we increase from 48 nits to 100 nits in digital cinema. This is an increase of one stop. One stop might not seem like a lot, but the other benefit here is as we move to laser diodes for lighting, is the black level drops because now we can have a, a more true black on the screen. So your contrast increases. Because as we move to high dynamic range, we're both raising the ceiling and dropping the floor. We still keep the 12-bit precision. We obviously are moving into 4K projection space and Rec 2020 colors. This is what I was talking about. It's a little bit fuzzy now. Everyone's still doing P3. But the potential exists that some of these projectors will be able to do Rec 2020. So as that exists, will open up that potential for the creative to work within that space. So let's look at the differences within the projector. I use a standard theatrical projector just to identify what SDR has been. This could be from Barco, Christie, uh, Sony had standard dynamic range projectors for the theater. Uh, really, anyone who was making the professional projector was targeting 48 nits on the screen, P3 color, and a DCI white point. 
as we move to high dynamic range in the theater, it's actually a little bit more confusing because there is no standard yet. So as theatrical projection moves forward, right now in the marketplace, there are kind of two potential different paths. And both effectively have to be respected because they each have their own numbers of theaters in the marketplace. So if we look at the Dolby Christie projector, so Christie worked with Dolby to create a high dynamic range projector, um, it basically hits around that 100 nit target. They are still in the P3 color space. That's why I have a star next to the Rec 2020. This is an example of somewhere where they're going to be able to open up that functionality in the future. And they've moved from a DCI white point to a D65 white point. So they have changed our white point as well. So this is something perceptively, obviously, the colorist is going to have to pay attention to that shift. IMAX is starting to roll out HDR projection. Uh, there's a little bit less detail out there about what their projectors are doing. They target around 100 nits. Because it is laser primaries, it's likely that they will have similar specifications to what the Dolby Christie projector is, but it's not disclosed at this time. So if we talk about basically the three different companies that are out there right now, we have IMAX, which is by far the leader of proprietary screens out in the marketplace. They have a thousand, more than a thousand locations in the market and have started to roll out their HDR projectors to those thousand plus screens. So this will be a slower ramp up, right? They're not gonna change out everything immediately. But as they do, they'll want HDR content for those screens. So right now, the Chinese Man Theater has an HDR projector, and they've started working it into other locations. So they are requesting HDR IMAX grades now. Barco, Barco is actually a little bit further behind in the marketplace. They uh, are starting uh, and kind of targeting a 2017 rollout for their HDR projectors, but they obviously have a lot of contracts with a lot of theaters. So you can see a barcode projector will start entering the marketplace. And then Dolby Cinema, or Dolby Vision for the cinema, which you might have heard about, uh, has started to enter the marketplace to challenge IMAX for their theatrical space. So IMAX with its thousand plus screens, Dolby has now signed a contract for a hundred uh, screens with AMC, uh, which will roll out over the next 10 years. They have about, uh, what is it, 14 screens in the world right now uh, and are slowly introducing more. So this is using that, using that Dolby Christie projector, but right now 14 screens and will be 100 over the next 10 years. So you can see that there's now content that's needed for this Dolby Vision projector as well. It's not quite the 3,500 plus screens that we've had for standard dynamic range projection to date, but it's just the beginning of that. So let's look at the workflow. What does this mean for us doing a grade for these different projectors? Well, it's not much different than what we've done before for theatrical. Once we grade and we have an output referred lookup table or, or something like it to a standard dynamic range projector, we can remove that output referred lookup table, replace it with a different projector's output referred lookup table, and trim the grade. There will always be a trim pass involved because as you change what the projector is and how the colors are behaving and potentially what the white point is and what the contrast is, a colorist is still gonna to have to touch it and make sure that it looks appropriate on that new screen. Because just because you have more dynamic range doesn't mean the story is supposed to be told that way. So different shots may take advantage of it, and we'll hear from a colorist later. Or different uh, scenes might take advantage of it, or a creative might choose to use the palette throughout the entire piece. But that's the creative choice that's available to them now. As we look at this, you'll see that every single projector has its own trim pass. This is a decision that will have to be made by anyone who's budgeting for production. Obviously, I'm still going to do the standard dynamic range projection master because I have 3,500 plus screens I have to go to. Then, on top of that, do I do a Dolby grade, a Dolby Christie grade? Do I do a Barco grade? Do I do both? Do I do all three? These are the questions that people have to answer as they budget for these different releases. So the potential exists right now, and as we see it, until we get to Barco releasing a screen or until we get to an open standard, which we will try to make happen, we kind of see the market moving towards four potential different masters for theatrical. So instead of the one that we had before, or I guess two, because IMAX used to do their own proprietary trim on top of it, we now have potential for four until the market coalesces together. The reason I started with theatrical for this presentation is it's the the least furthest along in its standardization. It's the least furthest along in coalescing around what it is. As we go into home video, I'll show you, there has been 
uh, coalescence and a target that's now been kind of focused uh, within an open standard format. So let's dive into home distribution. And to do that, I got to start with the displays. Display purchases, there's a lot of information up there. The only things that really matter are the two top lines, which basically says, as I am a consumer who's buying a new TV, what matters to me in buying my new TV? In the United States, for sure, number one is price. I want a cheap big TV, which obviously means that the quality isn't going to be great. What's interesting is the second largest purchase decision, and what was the first in 2013, is quality. So there is a drive in the marketplace. As much as we think everyone buys the, the cheaper TVs, there is a drive in the marketplace that if I'm buying my TV for my living room, that I want the best quality possible. Obviously, it's not everyone, but there is a big desire to have the best quality out there. And as we show you high dynamic range, you'll see there is a noticeable difference that when a consumer goes into a Best Buy or an Amazon store or, or wherever they are, looking at reviews and seeing these screens, they will see the major difference and probably tend towards wanting a high dynamic range screen. All major television manufacturers at this CES announced a high dynamic range screen. Not all high dynamic range screens are the same. I need to point this out and I'll point it out in greater detail later, but just because it has the letters HDR doesn't mean it is HDR. So I'm going to break down the numbers a little bit just so we understand what's actually going to hit and impact the marketplace. If we look at 2015 numbers of televisions sold, in the United States 34.8 million TVs were sold in 2015. Of that, only 4 million represented that 4K TV that UHD TV for the home. So even though we talk about it and we hear about UHD is the next big thing, it really has only represented 11.5% market penetration at this point. In addition to that, if we look at what the projection is for 2019, it's only projected by IHS to reach 34% of market penetration. This may accelerate as manufacturers shut down plants that do HD screens, but you see that there is a market adoption rate that has to happen. Not everything switches over overnight. We have to pay attention to that. Some more numbers around HDR. Uh, these are North America. So before I was showing US, I didn't have US numbers. I'm showing you North America as a greater whole. The ratios still hold up, which are in 2019, I will sell 20.1 million TVs within the United States that are UHD. Of those, only 6.4 million will be HDR, which means that that represents 32% of UHD TVs that will be HDR. I point that out because as we look at these new TVs, people buying brand new TVs in 2019, and we use these numbers to crunch them, really UHD HDR TVs will only represent, again, 11% of the marketplace. UHD SDR TVs, about 8 million will be sold in the United States. I crunch these numbers for the US specifically representing about 23%. And other TVs, which include HD, maybe a few 8K TVs out there, as some of the manufacturers are going that route. Um, but imagine you have a home. You have one flagship TV in your home. When you bought that new flagship TV, of course, you moved your other TV to another room. So you have a standard dynamic range TV there you have to pay attention to. But you have a kid's room. You have a kitchen. You have other places. You have a, maybe a pool room, if you're lucky enough. You have other places in your house where you're going to have additional TVs. So you're going to have a mix of high dynamic range and standard dynamic range in TVs, uh, of TVs in homes. Is this based off of the UHD Alliance certified TVs or just what the manufacturers are calling UHD? It's a great question. So the HDR is, and I'll get into what UHD Alliance Premium or UHD Premium is for the UHD Alliance. Um, that top percentage, that 3.8 million, is only representing the UHD Alliance Premium TV. There are two different specifications, I'd say, in the marketplace. One is HDR compatible, which goes into those TVs that can read an HDR signal but can't present an HDR signal, which is a little confusing. But what it means is that they'll take in that image and they'll tone map it down to what their screen can do. And then you have UHD Premium, which represents TVs that can actually represent an HDR image on the panel or on the TV at home. So it will be a little confusing, but the 3.8 million represent real 
UHD premium HDR TVs in the marketplace. So pointing out that kind of confusion about all these different TVs, all these different specifications is a great segue to the next slide, which is for years, we've done that SDR. We've graded to 100 nit peak. We graded to Rec 709. We knew that that TV would, that, that signal would go to a TV and it would look mostly correct if that TV was calibrated correctly. A lot of TVs in the marketplace as we move to LCDs have pushed higher brightness to three, maybe 400 nits to sell a premium TV that's brighter because consumers like bright. Doesn't necessarily represent the content correctly, but it wasn't terribly far off, again, if it was calibrated correctly. So we were fine with that for years, but the challenge comes, if I take that 100 nit content and send it to a bunch of other random specification TVs with different color gamuts, with different brightness, with who knows how much percentage of Rec 2020, we're getting into a place where we're gonna have a, a massive difference between what we create as content and what it represents on the screen. So can we do this? Can we just send an SDR signal to the TV? Sure. But then you're trusting the TV to do whatever it wants with it to make it be that content on that screen. So if you've seen dynamic mode or vivid mode or store mode, you know what will happen if we multiply that times 10, right? Your content will become overly exaggerated. It won't tell your same story. So how do we get around that? We have to move to creating high dynamic range content. But what does that mean? There was a fragmentation in the marketplace around what does that mean? People were saying, oh, it means 4,000 nits. It means 1,000 nits. It means P3. It means Rec 2020. It means 709. Some were even still claiming it meant gamma. These terms are different curves, different luminance, different color space, which obviously creates confusion and means either you have to generate multiple different copies for everyone's proprietary format, or again, can we get the industry to coalesce around an open format so everyone can hit one target in the grading facility and make sure that it hits the home correctly? And then to further the challenge more, right? we were talking about standard dynamic range TVs that will still be in your home. What happens when I send that HDR content to a home that has an SDR TV? That won't work. What you'll see is something that is not representing the content again. Because the, we change how the signal is structured, it will look incorrect on an SDR TV unless you do something in your distribution to mitigate that, to fix that problem. And we'll get into a little bit about distribution as we go further along the slides. So there are kind of now, as I said, it was coalescing, there are kind of now two approaches to HDR in the marketplace. One is a closed ecosystem approach, which is if I control everything from the beginning to the end in the home, I can ensure that it will be compatible. I can ensure that on the back end, that image will look somewhat like what the content was meant to look like. And we'll get into what a closed ecosystem or a sample of a closed ecosystem looks like. And then there's the other, which is if I can agree with a giant industry what is the standard, what is the target, like we had for X709, then I can grade to one target and there is no proprietary decoder on the back end every TV will be able to take in those specifications and make a proper looking image on that TV. So these are kind of the two different approaches that exist for the home today. So I was talking about that open, and to talk about that open standard, open format, I have to talk about standardization. Because to get an industry to move, there are many different standards bodies that have to move as well. So, and this will be a very complex slide, just to kind of give you guys the idea of what it means to standardize something in this marketplace. So you have the UHD Alliance, which was established uh, last, not this past CES, but CES 2015, uh, around how do we target a standard for content creation, content distribution, and content consumption, the consumer electronics device. And how do we tell the marketplace one message as an industry what HDR is? And I'll get into that in a little bit. You have other things like DCI, Digital Cinema Initiative, which has to focus on what we're going to do for digital cinema. You have other bodies, I'm not going to go through each one, but just to kind of give you an idea of what this landscape looks like, you have many, many different bodies that are all working on standard dynamic range. And each of these bodies started on their own, which means they were all going in potentially different directions. Once the UHD Alliance was established, 
it was the first place, the first location, different companies from content creators, from studios, uh, from technology companies, from distributors, and from CE companies could get together and focus on one standard for the industry or one single set of rules for the industry. So let's talk about that UHD Alliance. On the top, you'll see the founding members of that UHD Alliance, a mix of technology companies, studios, distributors, and CE companies, definitely representing the majors. Uh, Technicolor is a founding member of the UHD Alliance to create that open standard. Uh, and then all the other logos represent the contributing members that now exist. This is a huge group of people with a lot of contacts and a lot of connection to what this industry is going to do to move. And we've announced at CES 2016 our specification for content creation, which allows people to start creating content and allows content to start being distributed under a UHD Alliance moniker called UHD Premium. So UHD Premium, and we'll get into what these specifications mean, is an open standard or an open set of rules that people can grade to where it will be understood how to distribute this content and how to consume it on the back end. So we have a moving away from 2.4 gamma, which is the gamma curve that we've used for SDR grading to date. We move to 2084, or PQ sometimes called. This is a different curve. Instead of it being tied to the peak luminance and the minimum luminance of the display, it is tied to the absolute luminance of your output from the display. What this means is if I want this specific point in my display to be 100 nits or a certain measure of brightness, it will be 100 nits on every single screen. Now the challenge comes if I grade to 4,000 nits and my screen is only capable of 1,000 nits, what happens with the other 300 or 3,000 values? So this is where tone mapping comes into play. The TV has to do something to curve off the highlights to make it actually fit within that screen space. Otherwise, it would clip out detail. So at CES, we had 13 displays representing the UHD Premium logo. This is different than the compatible logo. So this is what I was talking about before. There are two different camps or two different ways to think of HDR. You could technically label under CTA a TV HDR, and it would be specifically HDR compatible. That does not mean it represents the content correctly. What it means is it can take in that HDR signal and show you an image, which is very different than it can take in that HDR signal and show me an image that represents the image it was supposed to. So these are two different logos to mean two different things. One is just it functions. The other one is it functions mostly correctly. So let's look at what these specifications are and how we actually change them. So if we look at those five different pillars again, the home distribution standard dynamic range content, no matter what we mastered it to, was sent to the home as HD mostly, 8-bit. So if you, even if you had 16-bit TIFFs as your MES file, it's crunched down to 8-bit for an AVC compression, so you lose your bit depth. And 24, 30 frames a second, maybe the content that we were distributing, standard dynamic range in Rec. 709. As we move to UHD Premium, we expand out on every axis. Some of you might notice the frame rate moved up to 60. This is not a mandate for it to be 60. It just allows for 60 frame content to exist in the ecosystem. So you can still have 24 frame content you can still have colors within Rec. 709 if you want, but there are now targets for what that mastering display should be, which allow you to grade to it. And you'll notice as I look at the dynamic range and luminance section, it still just says HDR. And I'll dig into why that is in a second, because there's still an open kind of mentality about what HDR could mean. And so there are two, basically, reference monitors in the marketplace that exist today for an HDR grade. Right, one more thing I would point out here is the move from 8-bit to 10-bit. This is one of the biggest changes for the distribution industry. Remember that I mentioned before, bit depth is about color precision. So this isn't representing more colors necessarily. The reason we're representing more colors is because of P3. But because we have better color precision, we can more accurately represent the color on the screen. We can more accurately ensure that the content that we made at a 16-bit um, color depth, we are actually able to represent better as it reaches the home. So let's look at this different types of content. And I say different types of content because as we dig into it, there are obviously a lot of different types of content we have to create for this new ecosystem that we're building up.
this is kind of the prediction of the way that the market is going to go. Don't hold me to the dates. The point is really the market is starting around creating HDR content. So movie content has already started to be created to this UHD Alliance premium specification. It's started to be created. And in fact, I'll show you some of the distributors are actually already distributing content. We think after movie content, live sports, live events will come next. They have their own restrictions, own rules, own things they have to abide by because they have a completely different workflow. I'll show you some of that high level um, in a little bit towards the end. Premium networks like HBO, Showtime, we think will come next. Those premium networks will come uh, on the heels as they're currently exploring how do I actually get my content out in every potential outlet, including broadcast, because they have to pay attention to letting out the same content everywhere. Basic channels will come after that. Your food network, your HGTV, your news, nightly news. So all of these are going to have to move to HDR. These represent you know, thousands of channels 24-7 that have to eventually move to this type of content. So this is why an open standard is important. If we had a closed proprietary system, we wouldn't be able to scale it to everyone. But if you have an open standard, then everyone can start creating content for this ecosystem. So we talked about movie and television content. That was that first line. This has been represented by the OTT industry mostly right now. Um, that UHD premium logo, that logoed content that fits that specification is currently being distributed by Amazon and by MGO and on Ultra HD Blu-rays. So now Ultra HD Blu-rays, uh, you can go to the store, you can buy high dynamic range content on a disc uh, from, from studios like Fox. In addition to that, you have Amazon distributing content. They have their own Amazon originals. We've done a majority of those Amazon originals in-house. So we help them to move forward in launching their HDR service. Uh, and MGO, which is a former company owned by Technicolor, that we also helped to launch into the HDR industry. And then live sports, and I'll talk about that workflow, like I said. But all of this is tied to also one other piece, which is how do you get it to the home? And one of those standards is broadcast. As much and as many of us that still have, or right now have, set-top boxes and cable and satellite and thousands and thousands of channels, there still is an underlying fundamental, which is how do I broadcast my basic channels to the home? And this starts to anchor everything as far as distribution. So the ATSC, which is responsible for getting high definition channels over the air, has been working towards an ATSC 3.0 standard that will allow content to be distributed over the air that is high dynamic range as well as fits other advanced characteristics. You'll see this roll out in Korea first. Korea is another ATSC country. The United States or North America is uh, second. So Korea will actually roll out HDR content over the air starting in 2017. The United States following in 2018. Pay TV operators will likely be ahead of these, but this represents the massive change of all those basic channels moving to high dynamic range, every piece of content wanting to move that way. So let's talk about movie and television workflows. First, let's look at standard dynamic range workflow to get ourselves familiar with what we've done to date. This is an example of the ACES workflow. Um, so those of you who are familiar with ACES will look at this and, and understand the different blocks that are there. The real purpose here is to show the camera on the left and the screen on the right. If I capture a raw file on my camera and I grade that file to that screen, I end up with a master SDR file. All right, I graded that content to that screen. I know what it looks like on that screen. That was my 100 nit 709 reference. Now I have my SDR file when I render that out. And you'll notice gamma on the bottom, which is the curve of luminance to that screen. Going to HDR, did you guys see the change? Right? So the only thing we really changed is the reference screen. No magic science behind it. If I change the reference screen, I can grade to a new HDR space and create a new HDR file. This is what is meant by an open approach. Anybody can get an HDR screen, grade to that screen, and have HDR content. This is different than a closed ecosystem, which we'll get into a little bit. Really, of course, it's not just the HDR screen that changes. If you have to change the grade or the output referred LUT, obviously these pieces have to change because the screen changed. But what's fundamentally important here is really the only thing that you're changing in your entire hardware is the screen. So let's look at screens, right? These are mastering displays. I use an SDR reference because there are several SDR references, so this just represents one. 
which would be roughly a thousand to one local contrast, depending on the plaque level, you can actually get off the screen, but that's usually what we target. 100 at peak, a point, it's a 0.116 nit level, but approximately 0.1. Rec 709 color, D65 white point. This is open standard space because we've had Rec 709 for years. So all SDR content can be graded to this monitor and these monitors are generally available. Next, we have a Dolby Pulsar. This is a representative of a closed ecosystem. Dolby has their own proprietary screen, uh, of which they have you know, seven or so, maybe 12 at any given moment in the world. These screens are now being used to create uh, studio content. So there is some studio content being made on a Dolby Pulsar, which now the peak white has moved from 100 nits to 4,000 nits. So a lot more brightness. And the dark level has moved down to 0.03, or a little bit less. And what this means is that I can now create content with a 133,000 to 1 contrast ratio. So now instead of 1,000 to 1, I have 133,000 to 1. So I have a lot more contrast available to me. And if you remember, high dynamic range being about dynamic range and contrast, this means that I have a lot more that I can play with. They kept the white point as D65, which makes sense so the home viewer is expecting the same white point for all their content. P3 color, opening up the color space to what certain panels are now available and capable of doing. And this is a Dolby proprietary ecosystem, meaning if I create content to this screen with the metadata that's associated with that screen, it will go to Dolby Vision TVs. And I'll show you what that workflow looks like in a little bit. There's another HDR monitor out in the marketplace called the Sony X300. This has been the one that's been approved by our colorist at Technicolor. The reason, there are several reasons for this, uh, one of them being the excellent local contrast ratio. I'll be clear, Technicolor does grading for both the Dolby, the Dolby Pulsar and the X300. The difference is just what that content can do in the ecosystem. We do find that people are doing maybe both. Uh, some people are doing one, some people are doing the other but a lot of people are also doing both. So this X300 represents a 10 million to one contrast ratio. It's actually greater than that. The problem is the black level, which we can measure down to four decimal points, we can't measure any lower. So when we say 0. 0.0000, it's because I can't get another decimal point to see what really light is coming off the screen. And so the reality is, it right now measures to an infinite contrast ratio, but I can't divide by infinite because I'll get infinite or undefined. So it represents greater than 10 million to one contrast ratio. The peak luminance on this screen is 1,000 nits. It's not as high as the 4,000 nits, it's 1,000 nits, but because the black level is so great, you have more dynamic range available to you to play with. This represents a target for the open standard grading that the UHD Alliance represents. So several of the studios have adhered to this for their target for open standard format content. And this is generally available. While it is expensive, you can go out and buy one. Whereas a proprietary screen, you have to get permission to use from the owner of that screen for your specific piece of content. So let's look at the workflows. We talked about how do you create the content. I'm going to look at the back end. Once I created the content, what does that mean for distribution? So once I created an SDR master, a standard dynamic range master, I could distribute that. Everyone knew what to do with it. For creating that master, I had all of my colorist tools available to me. I could use every tool in my, my bag of tricks to make my content. I knew the tool set I was working with. I could use any SDR reference. As long as it was calibrated, I knew what I was getting. I could use that reference. So anyone could create any content on any SDR reference screen available for any project. And masters would work on any end SDR device. This was our open ecosystem before, and still is for the majority of our content. Let's look at an example of what a UHD Alliance workflow might be and how you could distribute that. So if I just wanted to focus on just an HDR master, let's say I, I just want to create one master, I don't have the budget for both, I just want to do one. And I want to focus on the high dynamic range one, and that's it. How do I get that to a marketplace? Well, the first way, of course, is if I take that HDR file and distribute it through what the industry is now calling HDR10, I can get HDR to the home. The challenge there is, what do I do about my standard dynamic range customer? So there are solutions in the marketplace. I show one here. Um, 
that allow you to take in a high dynamic range signal, derive standard dynamic range, and distribute both to the home. This may not make sense for premium content, but if you have budget for one master, maybe it does. Or for sporting events, it absolutely does. They're only going to make one piece of content, and we'll get into that in a little bit. In this type of workflow, the colorist still has all their tools available to them so they can make that HDR screen. Remember that they just changed out the reference monitor so the tools didn't change. They can use any HDR reference. This shows the X300. Other HDR reference screens are coming out in the marketplace. They create this HDR UHDA premium content which can be displayed on any of the UHDA premium devices, UHD Alliance, UHD premium devices. By grading to something with a 10 million to 1 contrast ratio or greater. This can represent well on an LCD panel, which we'll show you in our demo, but also on an OLED panel. If I'm grading to something with a really good contrast, as I present it in an OLED in the home, which has really great contrast, I can take advantage of the local contrast. But an OLED might not have the brightness, whereas an LCD might go brighter. So because I can grade to 1,000 nits, as I take that content to an LCD, it represents that content well too. So now by grading to something with a great high dynamic range contrast, both types of end consumer devices can benefit. What if I wanted to create two masters? There are solutions for that as well. If I create two masters and I grade my HDR on my X300 using all my colorist tools available to me, and I grade my SDR on my SDR reference using all my tools available to me, I now have two files. I can now send this through distribution as my SDR file and my HDR file to customers. That's great, I now represent my content correctly. The challenge is, for a distributor, I just duplicated my infrastructure to go standard definition to high definition. I now want to move to HDR. Does that mean I have to duplicate everything again? That becomes a big challenge. So for a lot of distributors, one of the technologies that Technicolor has developed for helping boost that open ecosystem is a way to take both masters and, con and combine them into one signal. So now that one signal will be directly backwards compatible to the SDR home, and the metadata that we generate, which is the delta between the SDR and the HDR grade, can now be distributed to that home as well. And as it gets recombined on the back end, you have HDR for your HDR customer. As it doesn't get recombined, because the SDR content is the base, it ignores the metadata, all of your SDR screens work as well. So now one signal can distribute both pieces of content to the home. And let's look at the Pulsar workflow as well. So Dolby, the proprietary Dolby workflow, means that for creating my HDR content, I have all my tools available to me. I can create anything I want on that Pulsar screen. I now create my HDR content. I can distribute that as an HDR10 master. I have HDR on the home. To do my SDR, I must use a proprietary tool called the CMU and do a trim pass. This trim pass is using my HDR grade that I just did, using a tool set provided by Dolby to do a trim to the SDR screen. At this point, the colorist no longer has all the tools available to them. At this point, he has to use the tools available from Dolby to be able to do that trim pass. The reason for this is so that they can transmit that metadata later on and be able to use that metadata to tone map to Dolby Vision screens. So by doing that tone mapping, basically an estimation between your HDR grade and your SDR grade uh, using that metadata, you can potentially do a better job of representing that content on the screen. This is similar to what the Technicolor distribution was doing with the two masters, but using a proprietary tool set to derive the metadata. That would give you your Dolby Vision Master, and then theoretically, and I say it theoretically and I'll explain why in a second, your SDR trim would also be your SDR content that you could distribute. So here you would have your HDR, you'd have your Dolby Vision, and you'd have an SDR. And in that workflow, just because I'm from Technicolor, I'll tell you this HDR master and the SDR master could also be used, distributed through Technicolor's distribution. The reason I said theoretically is because this is what we're finding actually happens. The creative cares a lot about the millions of people that will see their standard dynamic range content because HDR is very new. As such, they care mostly about focusing on the standard dynamic range first. Ignoring everything to do with high dynamic range, let me create my vision for millions of people who will see this. Then, let me go ahead and make my HDR, whatever that is. I use the Dolby one here as an example. So if I create my SDR, 
and then I create my Dolby Vision version, I would then distribute my SDR file, my HDR10, and my Dolby Vision, but these would be three separate things, effectively. And then I could also use that same workflow to deliver the Technicolor stream as well. But this allows your customer, your, your creative, to create the best possible looking standard dynamic range content and the best possible looking high dynamic range content. Whether you're using a Pulsar or the X300 workflow for your high dynamic range, giving your colorist and your creatives the tool, the tools that they're used to and the tools that they have available to them to create their content means they'll do a better job. As we talk to Tim Vincent, you'll hear his feelings on this, which are exactly what I'm representing here. So what this means is for the home master, there right now is potentially three that we'd be targeting instead of the typical one. We have the standard dynamic range master we have to target. We have a UHD alliance master that we have to create because that's the open format that will hit everyone else. And then we have the option, if we want, to create the Dolby master as well. Looking at live events, this is what everyone thinks a live event workflow is. I take a camera, I distribute it, I go to a TV. Done, easy, simple. Obviously that's not the case. You have to look at everything involved with creating content. So it's not one camera, maybe it's 40. If I had to create all new HDR production, I have 40 cameras that I have to buy and I have a new production truck that I have to get together. That's really expensive to do. But wait, on top of that, the fact that I also have to do an SDR production which means I have to duplicate my people, duplicate the number of cameras, and duplicate the broadcast. It's not really practical to do this in a live environment. Two different sets of people creating two different pieces of content at the same time, in real time, live, is a very difficult thing to manage. Even doing one is a very difficult thing to manage. Imagine the challenges that they go through to do the Super Bowl, having to do it twice at the same time. It's way too much. So as, and it costs way too much as well. So as we look at this workflow, distributors and people who are producing live sporting events are looking for ways to simplify this. So there are a few options there. Uh, the first is what if I can just do HDR production and down convert to a standard dynamic range? We talked about that before in the single master HDR workflow. They're exploring that within the live broadcast environment too. I could just produce HDR, buy all new cameras, and distribute it both ways. But this still means that they have to duplicate their distribution infrastructure. There are solutions out there in the marketplace that allow them to combine that into one distribution. If I'm backwards compatible in my distribution signal, at that point, I can now send one signal to the SDR TV and the HDR TV. I've now cut out that cost. So you can see why these solutions and these uh, different technologies are necessary within a live environment. So much so that people are asking, well, I have this whole SDR infrastructure, do I have to replace all of my cameras or can I get away with only replacing a few key cameras in this workflow? So I gotta put the dollar signs up to represent how much money the option one takes. But of course you can. So if you take your 40 cameras, and let's say I wanna have four HDR cameras, I can't afford 40 replacements, so let me just buy four in my key locations and the other 36, let me up convert those to high dynamic range. So as I up convert those, I now am able to do an HDR production with my HDR infrastructure, my HDR production truck, and distribute one signal to the home. Great, I'm starting to cut down costs. So much so that people are also thinking, well, do I really need the HDR cameras? Of course, this is an option as well. You could just up convert all 40 cameras, the entire production that you made, after master control to high dynamic range. At this point, it's the same workflow for all your people. You don't change anything. Really, it's just an up conversion algorithm on the back end to get to HDR distribution. Remember earlier I said, there's always a trade-off, right? If you're getting, decreasing the cost, the quality won't be as good. But it'll still be good. So these are the decisions people are gonna make in a live distribution environment. My trade-off on cost versus my trade-off on quality. And we talked a little bit about ATSC 3.0. ATSC 3.0 is focused on, well, I have UHD HDR TVs, UHD SDR TVs, HD HDR TVs, and HD SDR TVs that I'm going to be broadcasting to. How do I get one signal to do all of that? So if I've already done a single distribution for HDR and SDR, the cherry on top is changing to a compression format called SHVC. 
SHVC allows for spatial scalability, which is resolution scalability within the signal. This means that I can now take one backwards compatible signal, scale it spatially for the UHD TVs, and represent it correctly on my HD TVs as well. So this is allowing you to do scalable things like scalable resolution. If I take in a 4K HDR signal, for example, I can derive a standard dynamic range UHD signal with metadata that takes it back to HDR and metadata that takes it back to 4K. So by having both of these pieces of metadata, I can now distribute it to the home and correctly have an HD SDR image on my HD SDR TV and the metadata for doing HDR will be combined to create my HD HDR TV. The challenge, remember, is when we go through standardization, these efforts take a long time to get people to coalesce around what is standard. So this is technology that's been filed for standardization in things like MPEG, in things like um, ATSC, DVB, ETSI, other standards bodies around the world. This is, back to Technicolor's open approach, this is actually technology we've developed. We've now combined efforts with Philips, which is another company that was developing it. We're encouraging others to join our efforts and be able to distribute a backwards compatible signal to the marketplace. The challenge with SHVC is there are very few encoders that do it today. So it's just starting. It's the next step beyond HVC. And some people might only want to do 4K or do adaptive bitrate streaming and other things that are creative for like OTT distribution.